All right, Ephesians chapter 6, if you want to turn there tonight, Ephesians chapter number 6, this is going to conclude our Bible study in the book of Ephesians. And chapter number 6 is where we're going to be tonight. And look, if you would, at verse number 18, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, we'll finish the chapter uh, here this evening. Ephesians 6, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And Paul goes on to ask a specific prayer request in this closing benediction. He says, as for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I, love what he says, as I ought to speak, but that you also may know my affairs and how how I do. And Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that, that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Now, just a, just a summary, and I, I won't because of time go into all the details of what we've covered in the prior uh, five chapters and then leading up to this, uh, but just to say that The book of Ephesians, and I don't believe this is an overstatement, is one of the richest books that you'll read anywhere in the Bible. If there's there's, um, a depth to it that you don't find, not not that the others aren't, but this just has a a unique depth to it and so so practical, but yet so uh, vital and, and doctrinal as well. Paul closes out what I believe is the one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written with, as Paul would, some very practical admonitions. It's kind of like in Romans, you have the first eight chapters that deal uh, with doctrine, and then even 9, 10, and 11 in the parenthetical chapters, and then he says at the very, in verse 12, I beseech you therefore, based on the aforementioned, and that's kind of what he does here at the conclusion of Ephesians chapter 6. So, let's jump right into the notes. And uh, we'll notice here tonight uh, what I've called a persistent prayer, a persistent prayer. He says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication, he says, in the spirit. Now, Paul is telling them not just to pray, but he's telling them to pray in the spirit. And I don't believe that he is talking about speaking in tongues in this verse. In doing so, the Spirit will make intercession for us. I want you to hold your place in Ephesians 6 and just quickly look over at Romans 8. I want you to see this this verse, Romans chapter 8, if you would, to kind of give you a good cross reference here. Hold your place in Ephesians 6 and go to Romans 8. As you're turning there, let me just ask you this question. Have you ever had a time in, in your Christian life where you didn't maybe know exactly what to pray for? You just kind of, you're, 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 you're fellowshipping with the Lord, maybe you're reading your Bible, you're in your time of devotions, and you're praying, but you just, you, or you're at a loss, maybe even a better way to put it. You're kind of at a loss. And you say, Lord, I don't even know what to pray for. Well, God answers that in, if you look at verse 26 in Romans 8. He says, likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. So there's some assistance there. He says, write what I'm saying. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We, we don't even know exactly what we're supposed to pray for, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, notice what it says, with groanings which cannot be uttered. In essence, you're not saying 
anything. The Spirit of God is making intercession for you. I don't know about you, but sometimes I take some solace in that, knowing that, Lord, I don't even know what to pray for. But you've said in your word, even if I don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit's going to make intercession for me. And it's according to the will of God. You look at verse 27. You're in Romans 8. Look at verse 27. And he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, searcheth the hearts. He knoweth what is in the, uh, is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, watch this, according to the will of God. So he's not just going to make intercession for you as you don't know what, what to pray for it, and this is the exact verbiage, as you ought to pray. You don't know what to pray for as you ought. You don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit is going to make intercession for you. And verse 27 says, it's going to be according to the will of God. Do you no matter what, no matter what it's going to be, it's going to be the right thing. Because you know what? God knows what's best for you and me. Amen. He knows better than we do. Paul requested specifically that the Ephesians would pray for, pray for him why? What was he even asking prayer for? He was saying, so, you, so I can open my mouth boldly, he says, to make others know the mystery of the gospel. Notice again, verse 18, go back to Ephesians 6, and notice verse 18. He says these words, and this is why I titled this point, persistent prayer. Have you, had something, have you ever had something you prayed for and you just gave up? You just stopped praying. No, he says praying always. Praying always. Would you, would you just briefly, as, a, as a, a side note to this point here, would you just consider, consider this go, and remember it as well? As we learned in 1 Peter, even though you already know this, consider God calls us to pray. He says, be, Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto who? He calls us to pray, number one. Number two, God always hears you when you pray. I want you to ponder that statement. I'm not just, I'm not just saying that. That's not just a fictitious thing that we say. God always hears you when you pray. 1 John 5, 14, watch this. And this is the confidence that we have in him, watch, that if we ask anything in his name, he will hear us. Oh, excuse me. If we ask anything according to his will, he will hear. Think about that. Hey, uh, let's put it this way. Put it this way. There's never a time that you pray that God doesn't hear you. Now, and not only that, I can actually say boldly, God answers every single, ten or every one of your prayers, God's answered. Every one. It's sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is yes. I've had a lot of things I've asked the Lord for. And, and, and I wondered why he didn't answer it. What, I, I want this. I need this. Not now. Maybe it's a timing thing, right? He'll hear you. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Sometimes we want something when we pray. We want it right now. And God says, I love you. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I know the timing is a little bit better. Would you please trust me? God calls us to pray. God hears every one of your prayers. God helps us pray. We just learned he makes intercession. God also places a hedge on those that do pray. So I'm talking about being persistent in prayer, but when you pray, he also places a hedge of protection. And this is the scariest part. I know I get accused of repeating myself, but uh, they say as you get older, you do it more often. So I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going to do it right now. God places a hedge on those that pray. Psalm 91.1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, I know this. If I take God at his word, which I do, if you get yourself a secret place and you abide there and you spend time there, the, the Bible says 
if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you're going to abide under the shadow, the shadow. That's a protection of the Almighty. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I go like this, okay? Kirby, my, my mind says this. I'm either going to be under the protection of the Almighty, because I'm there, or I'm not in my secret place, and so therefore I'm not going to be under that protection. So let me ask you this. How many of you want to be under the protection of God? Say amen. amen. Spend time in the secret place. Well, how do you do that? Be, be persistent in prayer. Praying always is what it says. God tells us to never stop praying. Men, Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Paul says pray without what? Jesus. What happens to a Christian if they fail to be persistent in prayer? What, what, so just extrapolate for a minute. What happens? They become weak. Th then you start struggling with your faith. You lose your joy. You'll feel distant from God. Imagine for a second, if you didn't talk to your spouse or your loved ones at all, would you feel close to them? Well, of course not. You, you feel close through building the relationship. So what's the admonition for you and me? Be persistent in prayer. Secondly, notice in your notes, perseverance for all saints. Perseverance for all saints. Look at verse 18 again, watching there into with all perseverance and supplication. Does it say for some of the saints or does it say for all? This is staying awake when you are praying and staying in your prayers. I'll say it again. Staying awake when you pray and staying with your prayers. So there's a perseverance. It means you, you do not give up. So let me, let me ask you a question. Periodically, I do this on Thursday night. So here's my question. Walk through with me tonight. Just give me a couple. I don't have a time for a lot of them, but walk with me through the biggest challenges we face when it comes to persevering in our prayer life. So just think about it for just a minute. What are the biggest challenges that we face persevering through our, in our prayer life? Anybody have just a simple thought? What challenges do we face along those lines? Yes, Sandy. We live in an instant society where we have to have things at our fingertips. Right now. Right Microwave. Right. Microwave. For the meek. Cares of the world. Cares of this world. Very good. Somebody else. What, what, what are some things that... That, we, that, that are challenges when it comes to just persevering in our prayer life. Maybe just a, a couple more. A couple more. What are some challenges? Jen. Brain overload. Absolutely. Lecta. Laziness. 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 Yeah, absolutely. You just, okay, I'm glad she said that. Real prayer, and I'm going to get here, so don't miss me. Real prayer is labor. It's labor. It's labor. And we're going to talk about that tonight in a minute. Look at the verse again. Notice it says, for all saints. We're told to pray for one. Last Sunday night, we looked at the body of Christ and how, we're, how each part of the body affects one another. And so we're, we serve together. We're united together. We're admonished by Paul to pray for all saints. By the way, not just for the ones that we like. And he said, and he's kind of in, in, intimating not just to do it nominally, praying with all perseverance so that it, it carries with it um, more than just a casual prayer. If you actually take the verbiage, he says, persevere through it. Now, if you, if you, I believe if you've ever had a set time, so I want you to follow me here, put your thinking caps on for just a minute. Uh, and, and ask yourself a question. This is an internal question. If you've ever had a set time that you've tried to stick to, that you've prayed for, that you've been persistent in, that you've persevered for, and, and you stuck with it, so follow me, I'm talking real prayer, okay? Guess what, guess what you battled? And I mean this, Real, real, real prayer where you're entering into prayer, where you're spending more than just a couple minutes and you're engaged in. By the way, real prayer is spiritual warfare. You're, you're, there's a lot of battles going on when you're praying. Yeah. 
Okay. I mean this. A set time you pray. I mean real, real prayer. Fighting thoughts as you pray. Jan mentioned the overload of the mind. Fighting thoughts as you pray. So follow me. Fighting thoughts. Number two. Battling fatigue as you pray. Whew. I mean, and sometimes it's the fatigue in the mind and sometimes it's the fatigue, you know, you're tired. Praying for things you may not want to pray for. Praying for somebody that you don't want to pray for. I had somebody say to me before, I'm not praying for our president. And I, they said, what do you think about that? I'll tell you in another message what I told them, but... You know, the Bible says, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You're, you're to pray for, that was Jesus himself said, pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. I, you want to wring their neck and Jesus says, pray for them. You and I are told to persevere in our prayer life. Real prayer, not rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, I'm talking about intercessory prayer. I'm talking about praying always. I'm talking about praying in the spirit. I'm talking about persistent prayer for all saints. It's real, folks, and it's one of the hardest things we do. We hear the analogy all the time. If I said, uh, next Saturday night, meet me downstairs at five o'clock. I've got filet mignon and sweet potato fries with some broccoli and uh, hot fudge sundaes for dessert. I want you to meet me there at five. Tanner has the grill and he's going to be cooking those and it's free. I'll see you here at five. There'd be a line. Meet me here at five on Saturday. We're going to spend an hour in prayer. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> now that's human nature. I get it. I'm not even trying to be harsh. I want the steak, but I'm trying to make a point there's a difference between casual prayer and real prayer. And one of the reasons Christians walk around weak in their Christian life is because they don't understand what it means to be persistent in prayer and persevere in prayer. That's where a relationship is built, is through prayer. And let me give you one example. We'll move to our next point very quickly. Jesus set the example. Look at Luke 22. Luke, Luke 22, Luke 22, please. I want everybody to see this. So let's hear those lovely pages turn on your iPhone. <laughs> I try so hard. I, I, I feel like I, I'm a little old school, but uh, I'm going to keep trying until the Lord comes back. Luke 22 And I want you to notice, and I'm just going to give an example in our persevering through prayer, okay? Here's just one example. There are many, but look at verse 39. If you're there, say amen. amen. 39, and, it, and uh, this is uh, Christ agony in the garden, verse 39, and he came out and, and as he went and, uh, and was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray ye that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And he kneeled down in what? Pray. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more what? And he sweat, as was as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Verse 45, and when he rose up from prayer, there it is again, he went to his disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, why sleep ye, rise and Pray, lest you enter into temptation. Persistent in prayer, praying always in the spirit. Persevere in prayer, 
and prayer for all the saints, our Lord set the example of persevering in prayer to the point of such agony that he sweat as if it were great drops of blood. The disciples didn't stay awake, nor did they persevere in their prayers for Jesus. The question for us tonight is, will we persevere or give in to the flesh? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Thirdly, notice if you would proudly proclaim, proudly proclaim. You're in, I'll go back to Ephesians chapter six, if you would please, Ephesians six. Look at verse 19, and, and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I open my, open my mouth boldly. Notice the context of Paul's prayer. What is he asking prayer for? That God would give him utterance, the ability to speak. Some people say, I, 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 I can't share the gospel because I can't speak very well. Well, have you prayed for utterance? He's saying, pray for me that God would give me utterance. That's the ability to speak. Secondly, he prayed for boldness. Look at the verse. He says, that I might open my mouth boldly. Listen, this is Paul's prayer. I want to open my mouth boldly. People say, well, I'm not very bold. Well, it's the same as utterance. When was the last time you prayed that God would open a door for you to witness, that he would give you the utterance so I can articulate the gospel, and that he would give me boldness so I can have the opportunity to speak out for the Lord when he wants? So, you have not because you ask not. I'm trying to challenge you tonight. Pray for it. God will honor it. Paul's prayer was tied to his passion, and that was verse 19. Look at it. To make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in bonds. Paul was not shy. God gave him boldness, and he proudly proclaimed the gospel. My life verse, if you were to pin me down, and ask me my life verse, it would be Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But the sister verse of that is Philippians 1.17. Paul said this, I am set for the defense of the gospel. Without seem, seeming hateful, without seeming hateful tonight, I say that because when you speak about Im immorality today, sometimes people will criticize you and say, well, that's hate speech or that's not, you know, uh, you can't say this or you can't say that. So I'm going to say tonight something with all grace as much as I possibly can. Have you ever considered how an unsaved world will proudly proclaim all different kinds of wickedness in or immorality. Unashamed, not embarrassed, with pride, stand for what they believe in. By the way, just as a side note to that, in America, they're absolutely entitled to do that. That's this country. They can do that. And I actually respect the First Amendment that people have the right to shout from the housetop what they believe. That's America. You're not going to silence that. But do I have the right to proudly proclaim what I believe? That God loves everybody. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for sins. And that's every sin. So, they'll shout it from the housetop, as I mentioned. They're prideful about it. They even, even in some communities call it pride. The sad part is there's many today in the Christian realm where those types of perversion that we're talking about, they're more bold, more unashamed, and more proud than some Christians for their own faith. Paul's praying for utterance. He's praying for boldness. And we need to be bold but we need, to, we need to speak the truth in love. If anyone should be proud, it should be a child of the living God. You know, I was pondering this for some reason. I was typing my notes for my message on, I think this was on Monday this week, and I started thinking about the song, How Deep the Father's Love That We Sing. I started thinking about the lyrics to that song. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice 
call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there his, uh, until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know it is finished. It closes by saying this, I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. I hope that's the case. I hope that we will boast in Jesus Christ and be proud and not kowtow uh, to what we see taking place all around us. Notice, fourthly, if you would, a personal knowledge. A personal. Look at chapter 6 and verse 21, if you would. Ephesians 6, 21. But that you may also know my affairs and, and, and how I do. And Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. Paul was concerned for the Ephesians. And he knew that they were concerned for him as well. And so he sent Tychicus to them to let him know his affairs and how he was doing. And by the way, by the way, we should do likewise. We, we should do likewise. We, and I mean to those on the field, to those in this country, to those in our town, and to those even on your own staff here at this church. You say, to, to, to do what? To know their affairs, to know their state, to understand uh, maybe a plight, to know how to pray for them. Why is he saying, I want to know their affairs? Their reports uh, are good news. Even when we have a mission report on Sunday night, I love the fact we do that. You know what that is? As cold waters are to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. I love to hear about what's happening in Brazil. I love to hear about what's happening in Vietnam. I love to hear about what's happening uh, in, in, in the Philippines. I love to hear about all over the world. It's good news from a far country. Knowing the affairs, if you look right at the verse, and I wouldn't discourage you tonight, but uh, with all the stats that are going on in Christendom today, and I just say it, it's alarming to say the least, and uh, just uh, told the story to, the, to, uh, to Kurt and PJ today, um, I was with Pastor Chapel recently, and we were just having a conversation, and and he told me a story about um, a room. He was in a room with a, a, a pretty large uh, group of pastors that pastor some, you know, moderate for I guess the average size average size church in America is eighty six people. So these churches were between four and five hundred people, and a group of pastors were in the room and. Obviously, he's a president of a Bible college, and so he's got his finger on it and knows the pulse of a little bit. And one of the topics they were discussing was, what type of environment is best to cultivate uh, if you're trying to train laborers for the harvest, and put it this way, put it this way, to send out missionaries and to have men and women be called out of churches to go onto the mission field, or for guys to step forward and be called to preach and pastor local churches, right? So do, he's, you're seeing the two extremes. So you have the woke crowd where it's just anything goes, there's no boundaries, there's no sin. It's uh, using your liberty as a license to sin and justifying yourself. That's that crowd. That's not the environment you're going to get a God called preachers that's going to preach the whole counsel of God. Then you have your fundies that are legalistic and over here and don't allow anything and taking things and just being ridiculous uh, and, you know, out of whack. So what environment? Well, obviously the answer is you want to do the best you can to be balanced. You want to preach the gospel. You want to have liberty, but you don't want to be in bondage and all this stuff. So the second question was, they talked, talked about that, of where, what they thought the best environment was. The second question was this. It was, he said, all right, how many of you pastors in this room right now to get a pulse on America and a pulse on our country have a senior high schooler in your church right now that God is calling them to preach or they're preparing to go to Bible college so they can go pastor a local church because God's called them to preach? And he said, not one of those guys raised their hand. Not anywhere in their churches. And the irony of that is he looked at me. It was just him and I. We were fellowship. And he said, I've never seen it like I see it right now. The landscape is different. Something's changing. 
Um, and so it is important to know the affairs. And if there is attrition and you have these things going on, by the way, as a little side note, he said this, yet I get calls all the time. The average pastor right now wants two staff members for their church all across the country because they need staff, you know? And so there's a, there's a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, quandary there. And so look at the text again about knowing the affairs and understanding the plights and different things and also to know how to pray and how to pray for all the saints. I say that to say this, know the affairs that will help you pray. And then lastly tonight, notice a principled love. Look at verse 24, a principled love. Grace be to you and all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. When you love him, you keep his words. Paul said this, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Let him be, what does that mean? Accursed. Jesus, by the way, did you know, did you know tonight, think, think about this statement. Did you know this evening that Jesus Christ knows if you love him or not? He knows that. And he also made a statement. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So how do you show that you love him? You keep his commandments. You do what he tells you to do. Jesus knows that learning to sincerely love the Lord should be one of the greatest pursuits of young and old alike. After all, it is the first and the greatest commandment. That concludes Paul's letter to the Ephesians.